ancient geopolymer in South American monument built 600 AD. Joint research program between the Geopolymer Institute and Universidad Católica San Pablo in Arequipa, Peru. The title, first result for Tiwanaku, Pumapunku, Bolivia. This is the map of uh, the Altiplano with Cusco, the Lake Titicaca, and Tiwanaku, Pumapunku. We are at uh, 3,850 meters above sea level. I will, we have at Tiwanaku the well famous um, Gate of the Sun. I will not focus on it. I am focusing on uh, the temple from Pumapunku that is close by and it is made of a group of megalithic slabs, the largest in the American continent. The chronology of the civilization in the Andes is very uh, young. Uh, Tiwanaku is a civilization that spans from AD 300 to 1000, but uh, the monuments were built between 600 and 700 and used until 900. You have Nazca, you have Wari with uh, Cusco, and then later, 500 years later, came the Incas. Built AD 600, 1400 years ago, destroyed AD 900, 500 years before the Inca Empire. The Gate of the Sun is made out of andesite, volcanic rock, and the Pumapunku Temple is made out of red sandstone, sedimentary stone. If we look from above at Google um, Earth, we see the village uh, Tuayanaco, this is the uh, Spanish spelling. And we have on the right the site of Taiwanaku, and on the left, crossing the road, the site of Pumapunku. Looking at Pumapunku from above, we have the sandstone megaliths, number one, number two, number three, and number four. They are one, two, three, four. When we enter the site, this is what we see. We see no buildings, everything has fallen apart, and they are not only remains of stone that are on the ground. And from above, we see the big megaliths, and we discover that uh, we will have, on this site, because of our study, the presence of two geopolymer methods, geopolymer in alkaline medium for red sandstone megaliths, and geopolymer in acidic medium for gray and desired structures. Method number one, Pumapunku red sandstone megaliths, we have the four big slabs, number one, number two, number three, number four. Number one is weighing 130 tons, this is a monster. Number two, 180 tons, they are practically seven to eight meters wide uh, in dimension. Slab number three is broken and uh, parts are vanished. And uh, slab number four is broken and uh, is, has been weighing 150 tons. The blocks uh, were broken very soon after construction by an earthquake and repaired uh, with a cram socket filled with a metal, which we suppose that it was copper. There are copper extraction there, or bronze. This is how uh, the site was, this is a tentative reconstruction, you see in red the four sandstone megalith. This is a very small uh, temple on a big terrace, four steps, 
And we have making uh, these uh, small tampons, the platforms number one, number two, number three, and number four. In 1970, uh, the Bolivian government started a scientific study uh, to determine the geological uh, provenance of these uh, giant uh, sandstone blocks. So, uh, we have the report uh, that uh, in Spanish is Procedencia de la Areniscas Utilizadas en el Templo Precolombino de Pumapunku, provenance of the sandstone used in the Precolombian Temple of Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, and they had selected six different sandstone locations that are far uh, away from Tiwanaku, between 8 kilometers and uh, 10, 11 kilometers. They selected uh, one and claimed this is the place where the stones are coming. Number one, and the uh, site number two is close by and could be also. In 2017, we took this information to start our investigation and we added a third site, number three, uh, Kayamarka. Why? Because uh, there are archaeological records in Kayamarka, in the village of Kayamarka, which state that uh, the village was in activity at that time of the construction. So for me it was clear that uh, human activities and a well, well defined uh, village was related to the stone material extraction. So this is what we see from uh, Google Earth. You have Pumapunku on the left and you have the, uh, on the level of the Altiplano, 3,820 meters. And then you have on the south uh, the various uh, uh, hills and mountains where we find sandstone uh, sources. Number one, Quebrada Causani. Number two, Cerro Amariani. And number three, Cayamarca. The team went all, and visited all these sites. So, first, the Kazani Quebrada. We had to climb up 300 meters to the plateau behind the tree. This is how it was in 1970, and this is how it is now, 2017. And we have to climb above, behind the tree, in order to reach the site that had been selected by the Bolivian archaeologist. Uh, here we have the GPS tracking of our climbing up to the site. We start 3,850 meters and reach uh, 4,159 meters up. So this is the Kazi Gebrada, we climbed up. And this is uh, official archaeology is claiming that uh, they used this steep Yama trap, trap for dragging their 150 tons megalith down to the valley. This is difficult to believe. When you arrive on the plateau, you see quadratic sandstone blocks, and you understand the reason why it has been chosen as a site. But we don't find any massive blocks. We have small blocks. American archaeologists are claiming that these are the remains of human quarrying activity. Bolivian archaeologists are telling no, these are not. In 1970, and this is what we have today, 2017, they wrote, typical process of disintegration by mechanical weathering, there were no actual sandstone quarries used by the Tiwanakotas, such as open pit, work or gallery, but instead they went to blocks separated by dia classes. This is a geological, natural weathering event. It happens that it is building quadratic blocks, but that's all. So the second site, Cerro Amariani, is easier to reach by jeep and the road. 
It is of uh, a same simili uh, uh, similar geological formation. We have uh, blocks. The third sign, Kayamarka, uh, is totally different. It starts from the village of Kayamarka and we will end up to the site that we consider being the real site. Kayamarka, Kayamarka we see is uh, the uh, spelling in Spanish and Kalamarka Mika is the spelling uh, in uh, local language. So this is the road that uh, goes to uh, the village of Kayamarka and this is the entrance of this village. And this is something typical for this village, you don't find that elsewhere. So it has an historical background. And you enter the village and it's astonishing, clean, with the bricks, pavement, and so forth. Something happened in this village. Then we continue our trip, so we leave uh, the, the village and continue to climb up on the uh, earth road and we will arrive at the site that had been selected by uh, our geologist and we have weathered blocks but more interesting we will have a particular feature that is a lay of weathered sandstone kalinitic clay good for geopolymer reaction in between the quadratic blocks and our geologist made this experimentation. And here, they are not. Okay, we have enough here, as you can see. You can take a very simple tool to break them down. You can see there is. This could be uh, a good material too. And you cannot break the, the yeah. hard one. Yeah. You see, you see. Hard one. Ah, oh, not the same sound. Uh -huh. This is from this. And this. Yes. There is. There is. You can see. We, f we find here. Even with our hands, we can. Breaking down. It's very easy. In so, we could start our investigation. We made, uh, uh, we took a sample from the monument, from platform number two. This is uh, on where the arrow is, and it is very close to the place where uh, the uh, Bolivian archaeologists took also their sample that is labeled number nine, so we could compare with uh, our investigation with what they had studied. Scientific uh, investigation, thin sections, optical microscope, X-rays diffraction, SAM, ADS, scanning electron microscopy. So we start with a thin section. We will compare the grain size of the sandstone. Sandstone is made out of quartz and feldspars and very minute part of uh, clays for, uh, for the first uh, source, Kao, Kazani, Krebrada, the one uh, 4,100 meters uh, above level. Uh, Amariani, the second one very easy to, to reach. The third one, Kayamarka and our monument stone. We compare the dimension of the crystals of the quartz and the feldspars. And it is obvious that the first one on the left, Kausani, is too fine. It does not fit with the monument sample. The second one, Amar, is too big. The, the grains are too big. It also does not fit with the monument sample. Uh, Marka, Kaya Marka seems to fit with this monument samples and it should be the source of the material. And if we look precisely at the Pumapunku sample of the monument, then we have 
the various aggregate, and in DSA it is disaggregated standstone aggregate. This is a natural disaggregated standstone aggregate that is not uh, coated with a very thin coating like others, but it is a very friedel, thick matrix that is not usual for sandstone. And this supports the idea of artificial geopolymer sandstone. This is a very important quantity of binder. We made uh, the chemical compositions of uh, the geological stone and uh, the monumental stone on the EDS. So we have for the Carzani, uh, Amariani, Marca, PP4, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicium, potassium, iron. We can uh, say that uh, for practically all of uh, the ingredients, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, potassium, iron, they are on the same range of, so it belongs to practically the same geological uh, event. This is how geolo geologists are explaining it. However, if we compare the sodium content, then we see that uh, for the monument we have twice the amount of sodium. Uh, for comparison to Kayamarka, uh, four, uh, three times or four times in comparison with Amarayani and practically all two from Karzani. So if we accept the idea that uh, Kayamarka was the source for the material to make this megalithic song, then we have to get the sodium from coming from elsewhere. And it has been added. And we have to look for the chemicals. Can we find the chemicals, or better, did they exploited the chemicals? For the red stanton megalite, we should have a sodium polysilate geopolymer in alkaline medium, so we have to look for natron, sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is extracted from Laguna Cachi, even in modern time. That is a small lake that is located south of the, the great Sala Uyani de Altiplano. They had caravans going back and forth practically every day from Tiwanaku to the south. This says the civilization is well known for their Yama caravans carrying everything. The Yama caravan went from Tiwanaku down to San Pedro de Atacama. We are at 3,800 meters high, and uh, San Pedro de Atacama is 750 kilometers away from Tiwanaku. And we have archaeological traces, records, uh, showing that they have been Yama caravans going back and forth. And uh, the tracking of the Yama caravan is coming to Laguna Cachi, that is close to uh, south of Sola Yuani. This is the Laguna Cachi from above, and this is the Lugana Cachi from the earth. And uh, uh, the Yama caravan track is going through Laguna Cachi, and the modern road is also going through Laguna Cachi. So we uh, made the SEM, scanning electron microscopy. We have uh, under the feldspar grain, this is F. A quartz grain is Q. We find ALB albite, chloride. Uh, but what we find is a very special albite. It is called by geologists an orthogenic albite. That is, it is something that is formed after the consolidation of the stone, of the sandstone. Imagine the sandstone, the sand uh, settles uh, on the bottom of the ocean and uh, start to, to harden through compression and so forth. 
uh, and after uh, one million years or two million years, uh, other uh, water uh, with alkaline small amount are uh, infiltrating uh, the sandstone, and it happens that because of the inclusions of the small amount of uh, alkali of sodium, we get the formation, the crystallization of albite, that is uh, sodium silicoaluminate, SiL3. We have it geologically. Usually these are big crystals. Here we have a very, very thin uniform layer. It could be the result of the crystallization of a polysilate, geopolymer, SiAl3. We have a higher concentration in the ingredient, and the crystallization and the formation of this autogenic albite could have happened during the 1,400 years of uh, archaeological burial. This is practically obvious. The problem is that we cannot make a difference so far today between geological albite or geopolymer albite. This is by EDS, SIALNA. You see the SIAL ratio 3, pure. So result of self crystallization. If we look at an other place under the electron microscope, then we see other strange structures that are also autogenic. That is, structures that have been crystallizing during a long time. And for us, during uh, the time necessary to build, uh, this is under the ADS uh, spectrum, what we get. We get a uh, high amount of silicate, aluminum, sodium, and iron on the right. High amount of iron. And this, uh, for us, is a uh, ferrocylate geopolymer. The iron is taking place of the aluminum, and we have a uh, CaLFA ratio of 2.3. So the first conclusion of this study is the thin section of a sample taken from the Pumapuku Red Sandstone Monument shows green boundary made of a thick fluidal red ferrocylate matrix. To our knowledge, this feature is very unusual in sandstone form geologically. It is a unicum and supports the idea of artificial sandstone geopolymer concrete. Remember, these are the huge megalites. It cannot be transported, so for us it is obvious that it is a type of geopolymer concrete. The complementary SEM ADS analysis for sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, potassium, calcium, iron, and ISRD suggests that the Kaya Marka site is the source for Pumapunku megalithic blocks. To make their geopolymer sandstone concrete, the builders may have transported finely weathered colonitized sandstone from the Kaya Marka site. They added foreign elements, natron, extracted from the Laguna Cachi, a small lake located south of the Great Sala de Uyani in the Altiplano. The megalithic slabs of between 130 and 180 tons made of angian geopolymer were cast 1,400 years ago. We have blocks, concrete blocks. We have concrete blocks, not small quadratic stones that they could have dragged down. This is impossible to drag down and this is impossible to make. The results of this study are under review in materials letter. I am waiting for the first reaction of my colleagues. Ancient geopolymer in South American monument, XRD, SEM, and petrographic evidence. These are the authors, and we hope it will be published very soon. So we have uh, Pumapunku, we have the sandstone 
terrace, 1,400 years old, but we also have small items. So remember, we found two different methods. We discussed the first one, geopolymer and alkaline medium for red sandstone megalite, and now we will find geopolymer and acidic medium for gray andesite volcanic structures. The part two will be this, dedicated to early andesite. Acidic medium, results of the reaction with carboxylic acid and phosphate-based andesite geopolymer concrete. This part of the Pumapunku temple was built 100 years later. We have addition of architectural elements. These are structural elements that have been added. These are more, from my point of view, sculptures. Sudan been added by another group. They are made of andesite, volcanic stones, and they have, they have puzzling features. One meter high, very, very precise uh, uh, reliefs, cuttings. How were such perfect cuts made with simple stone tools, perfect 90 degree cutting, very smooth. This speaks for itself. How can you do it without tools? Of course, they had hammer stones, they had stone tools. Hmm? Do it. More extravagant feature, this is this stone, which contains, has 20 holes drilled with precision, 30 centimeter deep inside this hard stone. Even those archaeometric people who are claiming that uh, this has been done by an ancient civilization 30,000 years ago or 60,000 years ago don't have the tool to replicate this. Remember, most hardness six to seven, like quartz, and they have no tools. So I show you now, I read you a description by an expert. The expert is uh, Jean-Pierre Protzen from University of California in Berkeley, and he studied uh, the Cusco architecture. And here he is uh, writing, who taught the Inca stonemasons who worked 500 years later, a comparison of Tiwanaku and Inca cutting stone masonry. This had been published in 1997 in Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians. I read, to obtain the smooth finishes, the perfectly planar faces, and exact right interior and exterior angles on the finely dressed stones they resulted, that is, adopted, to techniques unknown to the Incas and unknown to us at this time. So we have here an archaeologist who says we don't know. This is the first time that I am meeting an archaeologist claiming I don't know. The sharp and precise 90 degree anterior angles observed on various decorative motifs most likely were not made with hammer stones. No matter how fine the hammer stones point, it could never produce the crisp right interior angles seen on Tiwanaku Pumapunku stonework. Comparable cuts in Inca masonry all have rounded interior angles typical of the ponding techniques. The construction tools of the Tiwanakons, with perhaps the possible exception of hammer stones, remains essentially 
unknown and have yet to be discovered. Remember, this is an expert. For us, from the geopolymer world, it is obvious that this is the result of the wet sand geopolymer molding technique. You have all the features of an item, an artifact, that was obtained by pounding wet sand in a mold. You have a very, very, very precise surface, very clean, very plain, and in the surface you see small bubbles, semospherical air bubbles that were against the molds. It is clear, no problem. Where are the sources for this desert volcanic stone? You remember for sandstone, for the megalites, we relied on a petrographic study that was carried out in 1970s. But we don't have the equivalent for the volcanic stone. Why? So you have here the map, Tiwanaku, and underneath the various sites where we studied the sandstone source. Uh, according to travelers, the source of uh, the uh, monuments should be uh, the Cerro Capia Volcano. But it is located in Peru. You have in between the border. And at that time, in 1970, the Bolivian archaeologist could not, was well, not allowed to cross the border. So they did not make any analysis, petrographical analysis of the geological stones, and the Peruvians did not care. So that is known. So we started our scientification with what we had. We made uh, thin sections. We made essentially scanning electron microscopy. And we got the possibility of having good samples because on the site you see a lot of debris that are not part of the monuments. And by carefully choosing those debris that are in fact pieces of monumental stone with a characteristic uh, very flat surface, we were able to have our samples. This is the sample PP1. This is uh, the, we took the sample PP2. And this is where we took our sample PP5 on the surface of a laying uh, block. Now, most important are the samples PP1, PP1B, uh, and they are still, uh, we broke some pieces for uh, the SEM examination. You look at uh, the perfect surface of the sample. If we look under the optical microscope, this is what we see. When I first look under the optical microscope, I was struck. Nobody has looked with optical microscopy on the surface of these unique artifacts. This is strange. They are claiming this has been done by the aliens. They are claiming and so and so. There are no tool marks, nothing. But they did not take the time for looking under the, just the optical microscope. What you have here, you see the in white, these are the uh, plagioclase crystals. And in between, we have holes, holes, holes that are in different colors. It is a surface that is very plain, uniform, leveled, but full of holes. This is PP5. We have the white plagioclase, and in between holes that are 0.2 to 0.5 deep with clear walls, and underneath we see the crystals of uh, uh, the material. If we look on the cross section, you see on the surface, and you see the holes up to uh, 0.5 millimeter depth. But uh, in other cross section, we have the holes inside. 
So this is a material that is uh, typical for uh, these uh, artifacts. Looking at the, the thin section, it is beautiful under the polar rising uh, light, uh, better than uh, sandstone. You see in white the minute uh, plagioclase feldspar crystals, feldspar and plagioclase crystals. Then here the big amphibole uh, crystal, these are minerals, uh, pyroxene. And we have a lot of black spots. These are amorphous substances. Under the electron uh, scanning electron microscopy of uh, the PP1 sample, we just see uh, this is a five micron uh, scale, the small crystals. If we make uh, the ADS analysis, we find that it is pl feldspar, plagioclase. Now we continue our investigation. So uh, to look at the surface is boring. It is more interesting to look at the holes, what is underneath. And uh, we had uh, our point one, two, three, four, five, and then six and seven. I will focus on point number four. Focus on point number four at a, a higher magnification. So we have in black. This is the hole surrounded with feldspar crystals, and in fact it is made of several different minerals. And if we compare this uh, microscope peak view with uh, the SEM view, this is exactly what we have. So you see that on the left we have the plagioclase, this is the white body, H it is a horn blender, this is a crystal. Uh, PA is a, a pyroxene ogit crystal. FESEI is uh, ferrosilicate. And in between in the middle of that, we have something that does not correspond to any classified mineral from the optical microscope. And we will focus on it and we'll get a great surprise. We get the surprise of having a totally amorphous element that looks like rubber, gummy, anything. And we performed the ADS, we got a high amount of carbon, we got nitrogen, we cannot measure quantitatively nitrogen, but qualitatively we can see that we have nitrogen. So it could be uh, ammonium organic matter. So we are finding an organic matter in a volcanic rock, which is against nature. So it is uh, man-made. One could argue that since this is a, a, a dot, a point that was on the surface, that what we had been measuring was the result of uh, surface pollution. And then, in order to cope with this uh, argument, we went inside. So you see the sample uh, tray that supports uh, the sample, and we went inside and had several spots. Spot number one. Well, you see the black system all around is feldspars. And we have on the top of the black surface a crystal element. We have A and C analyzed. It is plagioclase. Then we analyze number B, that is underneath. It is organic. So we have feldspar plagioclase on the top of an organic matter. This is inside the stone. Another point. We have a very smooth surface that is, could be the surface of a binder. 
and we have the dark spot, so we focus on the dark spot. Organic, carbon, nitrogen. Spot number three, we have the same, carbon, nitrogen, and other elements. Everybody will agree with the fact that uh, this organic matter suggests the presence of an artificial stone. So, first conclusion, which chemistry? It is not polysilate-based geopolymer, like for the red sandstone megalith. It is not the alkaline medium. If it is not the alkaline medium, then it is acidic medium. And yes, this is acidic medium if we rely on the ancient legends that archaeology don't take into account. Una substancia de origen vegetal capaz de ablandar las piedras. Plant extract capable of softening stones. This is what the local South Americans are telling and reading. Crazy, the soil that can soften. 42 years ago, I met a Peruvian anthropologist and we decided to make our first presentation paper at an archaeometrical conference in New York. So we had a second in 1982. That reads, the first one, fabrication of stone, object, stone objects by geopolymeric synthesis in the pre-Incan Huanca civilization in Peru. It is now agreed that the Tiwanaku civilization is modeled on the pre incan Wonka civilization, revealed by an extraordinary skill in fabricating objects in stone. A recent ethnological discovery shows that some witch doctors in the Wonka tradition use no tools to make their little stone object, but still use a chemical dissolution of the stone material by plant extract, carboxylic acid. One year later, I made a uh, uh, scientific study with uh, the Laboratory of Pharmacognosy in Grenoble, the disaggregation of stone materials with organic acids from plant extracts, an ancient and universal technique. So we studied how can, what type of acid do we get from plants? And the conclusion was, the pre-Columbian farmers were quite capable of producing large quantities of acid from such common plants in their region as fruits, potatoes, maize, rubber, rumex, agava americana, these are the cactus, ficus indica, oxalis pubescens, and we know that there are more now. So, we will have carboxylic acids, Acetic acid, oxalic acid, citric acid. This works perfectly for limestone. Limestone is disaggregated by this organic acid, no problem. Very easy to prove. Any stone that contains limestone will be disaggregated, but not volcanic and desert. It doesn't work. So if it is the chemistry is used, it is only to fabricate a binder that will agglomerate non-consolidated stone material, then it is okay. So, clear cut between limestone and volcanic. Do we have archaeological hints suggesting that this idea is not crazy? Archaeological evidence on extensive culture of mice for possible manufacture of vinegar acidic acid. Another expert, specialist of uh, uh, the region, this is an American, uh, the experts are American archaeologists. Each one is uh, specialized in one site. Paul uh, Goldstein, Department of Anthropology, University of California. Mm. 
<clears throat> from stew eaters to maize drinkers, the chicha economy and Tiwanaku. The chicha is the very well-known local beverage. Sometimes it contains more or less alcohol in it, but this is essentially also produced from mice. So it is some alcoholical beverage that uh, can uh, uh, be used uh, by uh, their uh, ceremonial uh, activities. So Moquegua Valley, southern of Peru. So this is uh, located between the Pacific Ocean and uh, the uh, Tiwanaku side. Ceramic assemblages changed entirely with the arrival of Tiwanaku colonial settlement after AD 600, that is, when they started to build the monument, and the establishment of large enclaves at previously unoccupied locations in the valley. So the people from the top made enclavements in the valley at very precise places. The Chicha economy and Tiwanaku. Each community also included at least one household complex with numerous storage tignanchas, an in-situ feature installation of chicha brewing. The vessels set into the floor, these are big vessels, in association with large grinding stones, they are called manos, and a profusion of stone hooves. I continue. This evidence suggests that mice were stored and processed beyond the demands of the household and exported to exchange partners in the Highland Tiwanaku core. Nonetheless, it is yet unclear whether this exaggerated mice production indicates a centralized state tribute system. One household, for example, had a production capacity of 513 liters, a supply estimated to have been sufficient for 171 people. So for me, it is industry. The implication that ordinary household in Andean states might produce and serve chicha in quantities so far above household needs could help to explain three of the most puzzling aspects of the Tiwanaku phenomenon but they don't think of our system, they were thinking of their traditional way of using chicha. For us, this exaggerated production was not for beverages, but for stone making. So, several people tried to discover the secret of this stone making. For example, you can read in the internet things that have been done, uh, published in 1960s. For 14 years, that is, before 1960s, Father Lura studied the legends of the ancient Andes and finally managed to identify the Georgia shrub as the plant that, after being mixed and treated with other vegetables and substances, was able to turn the stone into mud. The ancient Indians dominated the technique of massification, says Father Lira in one of these articles. So this is the translation in English of an article written in Spanish. Softening the stone that they reduced to a soft mass that they could mold with ease. The priest performed several experiments with the Georgia shrub and he managed to get a solid rock to soften almost to liquefy. It does not say that it has been limestone, but it had, must have been limestone. However, he failed to harden it again. So he failed to harden it again. So he considered his experiment a failure. And this has been the reason why 40 years ago we also stopped. We can disaggregate but we were not able to re-agglomerate and harden it again. I waited to get the right knowledge. And this knowledge we started to obtain only one or two years ago. Research target, we have disaggregated, we have to find the hardener. 
how to reconstitute. And the basic chemistry is developed in my book, chapter 13, phosphate-based geopolymers, chapter 14, organic mineral geopolymers. So, research target, finding the hardener. Where can we find there the chemicals that will generate this reaction locally? For sandstone, we found the natron for the big megaliths. For the volcanic and desert stones, we have an organic binder, acidic medium, and we are looking for the hardener. I came to the crazy idea because, 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 because of all the information that I have no time to disclose here, that it should be the guano that has been extracted from Hilo and the Pacific Ocean. The guano that you find, that is commonly used as a fertilizer and that was transported by Yama caravans to the highlands. The guano is an excellent fertilizer, but this is not the reason why they transported it to the highlands. They, in the Tiwanaku civilization, was created before they exploited the guano. They had at Tiwanaku developed a very special agriculture. We did not need this type of fertilizer. They have their own fertilizer on the top. So to claim that the guano had been sent to the highlands because they needed it as a fertilizer for the agriculture is nonsense. This civilization was developed by itself. research target finding the hardener. This is the analysis that was carried out uh, 150 years ago on specimens of uh, Peruvian guano. So we find uric acid, oxalate of ammonia, muriate, this is chlorine, uh, uh, yeah, calcium chloride, phosphate, cl organic matter, phosphate of lime, calcium phosphate, with some phosphate of magnesia, uh, calcium oxalates, oxalate of lime, and water. And if we add some of the carboxylic acid that we have been manufacturing either for mice or other plants, the ammonium oxalate will be transformed into oxalic acid. Uh, phosphoric acid will, transform, will be transformed from phosphate of calcium. Calcium phosphate with acetic acid produces phosphoric acid. Uh, ammonium oxalate with uh, acetic acid produces oxalic acid. So we have our ox acids that will start the chemical reaction. Do we have some archaeological records on these caravans and trains between the guano of Hilo and uh, the Tiwanaku going up? from the sea level to 3,800 meters. Well, there's a here text on Guano Yano caravans between Ilo, Moquegua, and the Altiplano. This has been uh, published in the archaeological studies in Leiden University in uh, the Netherlands in 2005 by Willy Minkus and I've read. El Descanso, this is near Ilo. El Descanso means the resting place in Spanish. This name has been transmitted orally and refers to the traditional use of the site as resting place for the Yama caravans on their way to or from the highlands via Moquegua. The trade, guano, trade appears to have been intensified during the Tiwanaku phase of construction possibly stimulated by the need for more guano. Early colonial documents state that Yama caravans carried 
this trade item. The coastal Ilo population received coca, camelid wool, dried meat, as well as yamas for guano transportation in exchange. So we visited the uh, Ilo site, the Punta Corles guano site. This is a natural reserve. We have the birds making their guano, and we took a sample of the guano. Under the optical microscope, this is how it looked like. This is a one millimeter scale. And under the electronic microscope and the analysis, this is what it looks like. Carbon, nitrogen, and the rest, and the rest. So we have the organic matter in volcanic andesite stone. Does it contain guano? or remains of guano, or guano that has not reacted. If we compare uh, the EDS spectrum from the Pumapunku monument, we have the carbon, the nitrogen, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphor, sulfur, chlorine, potassium, and calcium. Can you imagine chlorine there? This is the monument. This is the guano, carbon, nitrogen, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphate, sulfate, chlorine, potassium, calcium, and iron. We have the same components, but in the stone it is diluted, which seems obvious, but it is the same chemistry. Conclusion. The SEM study of a sample taken from the Pumapunku Grey Andesite Monument shows the presence of organic matter. It could be the binder. We have carbon, nitrogen, and the like. This feature is very unusual in a volcanic stone. It is a unicum and supports the idea of artificial andesite geopolymer concrete. To make the geopolymer andesite concrete, the builders may have transported non-consolidated volcanic tuff, sand size, from the Cerro Capia site. They used an acid-based geopolymer technology involving carboxylic acids manufactured from local biomass which reacted with a hardener based on guano transported by Yama caravans from the Ilo coastal area up to Tiwanaku. The andesitic architectural elements of finely sculptured patterns are made of ancient geopolymer cast 1,300 years ago. To sum up, we have the red sandstone megaliths this is an alkaline geopolymer, 1,400 years of age. And we have the grey andesite structures, acidic geopolymer, 1,300 years of age. Relying on the old legends with plants extract capable of softening stone. What next? The Gate of the Sun is andesitic, dating to the same period. Is it ancient geopolymer? What about the Cusco walls, 450 kilometers up north? Are they of the same material? Is it andesite or is it limestone? We see that they are both. Are they using the same method? We don't know. We don't, have not studied it. But these are only questions. What next? No modern analysis for the presumed geological source at Cerro Capia Volcano. There are several types of andesitic material, so there should be very several types of source that we have to study. These studies should be carried out with our Peruvian geologists. The team on the site, our geologists, 
Louis Huaman from Arequipa, and Rolf from Geopolymer Institute. This has been my talk, Ancient Geopolymer in South American Monuments. And this is the replica that we made in the lab here of the formula using modern chemicals. It works, there is no problem. It, this is the white replica of a red sandstone block. <laughs> and this is the white replica of a volcanic andesit block with the same chemicals but different minerals as fillers. So, this is the last um, slide. This is something uh, we have been, uh, I have been personally astonished about what we discovered. Uh, I think it is uh, something, it is the beginning of a very uh, complicated detailed research, but this is the bottom line that we have to follow. And I'm asking our uh, South American friends that to raise the question, aha, uh -huh, why not in Colombia? Why not in Mexico? Why not in Peru? We know, and so forth. But then how to start studies by introducing uh, the knowledge of geopolymeric reactions? Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>